This is Taking the Lead, a podcast for B2B tech professionals, leaders, and executives who want to learn from female icons in the tech industry. In each episode, host Christina Brady interviews women who are driving revenue for some of the most respected tech companies in the world. Are you ready to get inspired? Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Taking the Lead. I am Christina Brady. I am your host, and I am the new co-founder and CEO of a company called Luster. And today, like always, I'm spending my time in my passion place, which is elevating the iconic women of tech. And before I get to that, I want to thank our partners and folks who are supporting Women's Voices, Women in Sales, Renegade Operations, and of course, my company, Luster. If you have not heard of Women in Sales, they are focused on elevating, empowering, and promoting women within the sales profession. And in order to realize this vision and create more equitable sales teams in the future, they recognize that everyone needs to be a part of that conversation. If you would like to be a part of Women in Sales, Get involved, head over to www.women-in.sales.com and you can join the conversation on Slack. And that brings me over to my incredible folks at Renegade Operations. If you find yourself, like all of us, struggling with growing revenue with traditional frameworks and tactics, perhaps it's time to challenge the status quo and unleash untapped revenue potential with Renegade Operations, a woman-owned RevOps consultancy. Can we talk about it? Laura Wheeler is the founder of that business. She has over 16 years in direct sales, operations, and enablement. If you are ready to optimize in a new, unique way with an incredible individual, head over to renegadeoperations.com to learn more. And that brings me to Luster, my passion project. We are scaling sales practice with custom-built conversational AI technology. We are providing sales teams with the ability to master call simulations and skill drills that mimic real-world customer and prospect interactions. We are built by go-to-market experts for go-to-market teams, and we aim to expose enablement ROI and bring predictive enablement to the hands of all. Visit us at www.luster.ai to learn more. The beta version is launched. Go get it, go-to-market teams. And speaking of going and getting it, I am here with Steph White. Steph, welcome to the show. Thank you for listening to my monologue. (laughs) Thank you for having me. I was trying to do some actions to support that. Yes, yes to all things women in sales, renegade operations, and luster. Yes. Dropping that in there. It Very the best. <laughs> and you're the best. Like your energy, you're feeding me today. Like I have a Diet Coke. I don't need it. I'm just going to drink you in. Tell us. <laughs> see the weird things have already started. Tell us your journey. You're an incredible individual. I can't talk to anybody in this space without your name coming up. True story. Tell us who you are how you got where you are. What's your story? (laughs) So I think, first of all, there's so many incredible people in this space. And I love this community because it's all about lifting each other up. I will often in enablement circles go by the Canadian stuff. There's so (laughs) many awesome stuffs in enablement. Unfortunately, a lot of us do like our blonde highlights. We're all around about the same height. So I'm the Canadian one. I am based just outside of Toronto. You will notice an A. Feel free to send me a message. Make fun of me later. It's okay. A boot. I've heard a few of it just like a few times, but I I love it. It's fun. We embrace it. (laughs) So my career, it's not straightforward. It's a zigzag. And I love embracing the zigzag. I'm a huge proponent of it. Looking back on it, It would seem like it was all very intentional, but it wasn't. I started in experiential marketing, which for those of you that are in the elder millennial category, you may remember the Pepsi challenges and some of those customer events, right? Those were great. They brought brands alive. I actually started my career working on a lot of those campaigns with a marketing agency, which was wild. It was out in field with customers literally pen and paper, trying to get customer feedback to then give to these CPG companies to say, you have this new light beer. Here's what people actually think when they drink it. So that was the start. And I started zigzagging through different sales roles at retail, driving around with a trunk of product in my car. Again, it's old school. It's fine. Nobody (laughs) believes I'm under 30, so we'll just embrace it. And then eventually I landed in tech 
and I was an AM. I was a launch and implementation manager at a SaaS company. I was an AE. Then I was a technical seller. Then I was a manager of CS and all these steps in between. Jill of all, master of none. But looking back as I'm now at almost 20 years with the last six in sales enablement and sales ops, it's all been focused on how do we understand and provide a better customer experience? Hmm. And that's the root of why I do what I do and where I'm at and helping people to do just that, to provide better customer experiences. That's my zigzag story. I am obsessed with it. And I think too, what, what you're honing in on is a really broad topic, but I feel like so much of it starts in communication and how we communicate to each other. And I know one of the things that you're really passionate about is how to set the tone in conversations or how to change the tone or shift the tone, right? Like one of the things that I used to, when I was a sales rep, one of the things I identified that I had to do early on was I'm going to be able to go into the sales call and the prospect thinks they're setting the tone. And if you let them, they will. And if that goes well, it's going to be a great call. And if they're in a bad mood or you catch them off guard or they've just come out of a difficult meeting or a hard one-on-one, -on -one, the tone is different. And so there's this idea of how do I shift the tone to a place where we're going to be productive? And if I don't identify that I can shift the tone, then do I display some kindness and let that person out of the conversation? And so I know this is very close to your heart, which is if you want to be a successful leader, person, rep, CSM, recognizing your ability to change and shift the tones in communication is important. Where do we start with that conversation? Are you ready to get on the bus? I am. I'm already, I'm driving it. I think you're the bus and I'm driving. No, that's the, there's no bus. We're just going to bus load today. That's, that's a, a blue bus. Maybe it's like a double decker. No, it's, you know what? It's fine. Okay. My zigzag. Mm -hmm. Listen, it, it wasn't always pretty. We try a lot of things. I would love to sit here and be like, I'm amazing at all things. You are not like we all try and we fumble and we stumble and we learn. It's not a failure if we don't get up and move forward from what we did. A number of years ago, not sponsored by this book, however, introducing the energy book. It's the energy bus. And it's by John Gordon, who's written a whole bunch of books. This book for me, I got it back in 2018 when I was at a really interesting point professionally and personally. I had become a mom. I was transitioning from being a seller to a leader in a business that was acquiring other companies. And I was trying to figure out my new self. And that can be challenging. It's not always pretty. And I actually got this book from my boss, who was the CEO. And he wrote a really nice message in the front of it. And I <laughs> did what any young person that thought they knew it all did. And I put it on the shelf. I didn't read it. And I went back to it at the start of COVID. And I started reading this book. And the concept of the energy bus is at its core, you decide how you show up in a day. You decide how you respond, not react to the things that happen in the day. And you drive your bus forward on the road that you want to be on. And I've really oversimplified it. But the idea with this book, and there's 10 rules, and it's a cute story, it's a fast read, but the idea is as a leader, as a seller, as any person in any room, title or not, your ability to influence the energy of that room and guide people towards positivity and productivity starts with you controlling it and guiding it yourself. So it starts with you, but that you have the incredible power, no matter who you are, to create positive change and positive outcomes in any situation. And so when I went back to this book at the start of COVID, when things were dark and everyone's reevaluating, I was in it. I was like, I'm on the bus. These are the people I want on my bus. This is my vision. I need to apply this to my life because I feel like there's no control in these lockdowns and in these changes. I have no control. The stock market's doing these crazy things. And what it actually started to do was give me the sense that 
I don't need to control all of that. I need to be empowered for all of this. Mm-hmm. It's not about control. It's about empowering yourself and empowering others on their paths and going towards the good that each of us get to define. Your voice is like a lullaby. I feel like you're already doing it, like you're tone setting this conversation. I'm just listening to this and taking it all in. And on the one hand, where I think it feels so comforting is that I hear so much everywhere in the echo chamber, like control, I'm going to control what I can control. And very few people define what that is. And so we wind up stuck in this paralysis of, okay, I know I'm supposed to control what I can control. I don't know what I can control. Everything feels out of my control. And I think where this can be difficult is I certainly have felt at times where my own emotions, my mood is out of my own control and how you go and get it back. And so I think on the one hand, it's empowering to have this idea that I can approach the day and I can control my attitude and my tone and how I make other people feel. I can control my ability to manage my energy and thus somebody else's energy. What are your tips on how to actually embrace that though? Like on an easy day, let's pop off. We are ready. We are pot. It's, we are suited and booted. Let's go on a difficult day though. You can feel not in control of yourself. Yeah. What do you do in those days? Yeah. So uh, first of all, you suit up in blue, Christina. You That's suit up. If you're only listening to this and not watching, we both showed up wearing an identical color, very similar shirt. We're like the blonde, we're like the blonde and redheaded twins right now, just talking about <laughs> being wearing and energy. So you show up in your blue, you show up in your what day, yeah. your Thursday blue. You do. Blue, sunny sky. No, listen. Sometimes there's a lot more hard days than there are easy days. Yeah. It's not about being Pollyanna. It's not all rainbows and butterflies. That's not, I think when you try to make a positive outlook that, that can actually deter people away. That's that can, disingenuous. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It seems you have no sweet clue because your head's in the clouds, right? Or rose colored glasses. We hear this expression. What I find is on the hard days, a couple of things. Sometimes we know these hard days are coming. We know, right? Sometimes there's a meeting that's scheduled for tomorrow. Maybe it's with somebody and you're just already, you have a physical reaction where your shoulders slump and you're like, oh, this is going to be a tough meeting, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a physical reaction there. There's a psychological reaction, certainly. And so it's making the game plan in your head. Okay, there's going to be this meeting right? It's with somebody I anticipate there's going to be this potential challenge or they're going to have friction or resistance. Let me define what my goal is for the outcome of this meeting. Forget what it is on the agenda. Forget what this person or the business need is. What is my goal? Is my definition of success for this meeting that I want to feel like we've connected on what the true root of the problem is? Is my goal for this meeting that I want to feel heard, that I want to get X, Y, Z? Again, the idea is focusing on a positive outcome and getting to a positive outcome that we define and we empower ourselves to get to. So we can do it as a prep work, right? When we've got those things that we know are coming. There's the reality. A lot of stuff that hits us, just like bird poop, falls out of the sky. (laughs) And it lands. What a correlation. (laughs) What do I do with that? Some say that's good luck. I don't. And and this is, some people will say, yeah, that's good. And again, it's such a good example of it is what you make of it. I don't know, this bird poop situation. I don't know. Maybe you needed hair gel. I'm not sure. But sometimes this stuff just hits us. And in those moments, it's, okay, here's the reality of what I'm facing what good can still come of this? One analogy is like, this morning I was making breakfast. It was super early for my daughter and I dropped my toast with almond butter on the floor. No, we We're like normally not a big deal, but we were rushing out of the house 5.45 in the morning. We had places to go to things. And I had a minute where I'm looking at my breakfast on the floor and my initial reaction is whole body slump, right? It's like I'm five again, whole body slump. I don't have time to make more toast. Now I'm going to be late for my thing. And it was a very me, I'm the victim, 
lack of control response. And my daughter, bless her, she goes, at least your banana didn't fall. So here's the reminder in that, right? Okay, yes, my toast fell. And yes, this is just a silly analogy. But in these moments, there is always a positive outcome that comes out of it. My banana didn't fall. By the way, I'm also fortunate enough, I have another piece of bread and I have more almond butter. And even though I may not get the chance to toast it, hey, now I can actually fold it over and go in the car and it's not gonna leave crumbs everywhere because it's not as crumbly. The idea just being that these things are gonna happen to us throughout the day. And we all have a choice in those moments of breakfast on the floor where we decide, where do I go from here? And how am I going to work this impact my day? Yeah. And I think that the exercise of what now, the toast on a floor is such a good example. It reminds me the, the other day it was, I was having a day and at this moment I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do the healthy thing. I'm going to go on a walk and I really just need a, a big Starbucks iced coffee. I was like, and that's, and I was like, having a bad day, I'm going to take a walk. I'm going to listen to music. I'm going to get my coffee. I'm going to take the dog with me. She's super cute. And I'm like, this is going to be amazing. So I go, I get the coffee. I come home. I put the coffee on the ground. The dog sees a, I don't know, a squirrel and like runs toward the squirrel and her leash catches the coffee and just spills it everywhere. And I'm just sitting there staring at it. And I was like, and it's like in those moments to retrain when you're already feeling down. And that's a, these are light examples and you can go into some real life hardship, which I know most people have experienced some hardship where you take this and we're talking about the five pound weights right now. And sometimes people feel like they have to lift up a car and they're like, how do I convince myself to see the silver lining when I have to lift a car? with my bare hands and I'm not equipped to do that. And I don't know what positive looks like. And so I think starting small with these little five pound lifts of like, how do I take something small and seemingly in the course of the universe and my own life, like in my own life, spilling a coffee is insignificant in the moment, devastating, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not over it. You know what I mean? It's two weeks ago, but like in terms of life, yeah, not that devastating. So you practice in those moments, what do you do as an individual when you get really hit by life yeah. and you can't find it in yourself to say, I'm going to see the yeah. silver lining? What is the next thing that you do? I think, so there's a couple of parts of this, right? So there's these small ways that we can maintain a positive outlook throughout our day. There's also the practice of some people have a gratitude journal. Oh, <laughs> I've tried that. That's it just, it's not it part of my me either, but I think it's a beautiful idea. Yeah. But the idea that at the end of the day, let your last thoughts before bed be positive ones. Reflect on what was good of the day. Not all the things you didn't do. I know so many people, and I've certainly fallen victim to this too. You lay in bed at night and I keep my to-do list on my phone. And it's, oh, and I need to do this. And I didn't get this done. And I didn't get this done. And like, I add to it and I'm adding to my mental and emotional load right before bed, which is supposed to be this relaxing time, right? And instead, I started creating this hit list, if you will. And so at the end of the evening, I take things off my to-do list and I put them onto my hit list from the week. And so what actually happens is I have this to-do list, which is, let's say this long. And okay, I maybe only got half of it done, but I copy and paste that and I go into my weekly list where I've done all the things and it's much larger. And I'm like, boom, just added some more on there. So I end up going to bed, not focused on the three things I didn't get done, but on the three things I did and how much I've actually accomplished over the week. And so just more of those intentional practices to frame for your own positive outlook. But listen, the big rocks layoffs are certainly something that a lot of people can relate to. Like you just get laid off and someone's like, what's the positive though? And you're like, the positive is I'm not currently chopping you in the throat or yeeting you into the sun. And I want to be, you can't say that. <laughs> is that frowned upon? Can you, say, I mean, oh, you just got oh, fired. You say whatever you want. What are they going to do? I didn't know that was a problem. In point. <laughs> okay. So let's use layoffs. Cause that's a highly relatable one. I got hit by a riff earlier this year for those yeah, that don't know. Good. It happens sometimes what's coming because you can read the tea leaves of the business. Sometimes you don't. 
It sucks. Yeah. Do I have the perfect answer for everybody? No. I can share what I did when it happened to me earlier this year while I was trying to focus on this mindset, which was I had a feeling it was coming. Some of these things you can see in the revenue numbers. And I got off my call, the call that we all have. And I went downstairs and I poured myself a coffee and I sat on the couch looking out the window. So away from my laptop, away from all things I would affiliate with work. I turned on the radio. I had my coffee listening to the radio, finished my cup of coffee, went upstairs, put on my running shoes and went for a run outside. The reason why that's significant was because that is in the category of something that was a privilege for me to be able to do between the hours of nine to five. I sit at my desk chugging coffee. I don't enjoy it while looking at the blue sky and the birds. I jam in my workouts at night between family responsibilities and going to sleep because I don't get the time during the day. Even in that moment of okay, when do the dollars end? And how am I going to figure out this and this? It was a moment to say, I will deal with all of that. That will come. But right now in this moment, I'm choosing a moment of positivity for me. And I'm going to take this moment as a privilege. And this is when there's paperwork that you're waiting for. And it's such a yucky feeling, but I ended up going outside for a run. And I had an hour and a half in the fresh air that I don't get during the work day because I work from home so often. We're in here all day long. And then I had a really nice lunch with my husband at home, which again, normally I'm jamming food in my mouth at my desk while I'm working. And then in the afternoon, it was, okay, how do I feel now? And what do I want in my next chapter? So I didn't let myself get swept up. I still had to deal with the realities of it. And that came But in the moment, I focused on me and what it meant that I actually had a moment of freedom in my day, quite literally, because my calendar was suddenly empty. (laughs) What a gift. (laughs) Oh, I don't have a meeting. Cool. Um, I laugh about it, but it was really like, it was one of those moments that I could have sat there and cried. I could have sat there and stressed and belabored all of it. And it would not have gotten me any further ahead on actually solving the problem. So here I was, I went out for my run and I had a really nice lunch with my husband and we laughed about it and we made jokes about it. What do I want to do now with my midlife crisis? What can, what are the things? <laughs> right? Pivot it. <laughs> we pivot. I'm going to use jargon, even though I'm not working right Synergy. now. Synergy. But I really took it as a moment to just respect and appreciate me. Forget all that. Give me a second. And the next morning I sat down on my laptop and the paperwork was there, right? It had come in. It was okay. Listen, it was on my time. It was about me empowering me to take the time I needed. And I saw my paperwork and I was like, okay. Dealt with my paperwork. And then I said, what do I want to do next? Right? What does that look like for me? So that was a big rock. And I realized some people might say, well, that's nice. You didn't have to stress about it. Listen, all those bills and all those same concerns, they were there and they were real and they were something that I dealt with in the days to come. But it was so much easier to process it in the days to come when I didn't let myself get swept up in it in that moment. In the moment, I chose to feel empowered rather than powerless. Mm. Perspective is a gift. I say that a lot. And that the story of I, listening to that, I, I just was swept away by it a little bit because in the moment when all is pain, it's very hard to pull back from that, right? As human beings, as, as living things, when we feel pain or we feel threatened or we think about the hierarchy of needs and the core of that is shaken to be able to have the self-awareness and the wherewithal to sit back and say, you know what? I love running and I never get a chance during the day to run. And I've just been awarded the opportunity to do that. That's incredible, right? To look at it as I, this entire time have been sitting at a dinner party and being served poison. And I just got the opportunity 
to get up from that dinner table and leave. And it's hard to view sometimes being laid off like that because we associate our jobs with our self-worth so, so intensely. And when you're laid off, it's hard for it to not feel personal. Sure, the numbers say that and you the writing is on the wall. But when I was laid off in 2020, there's no way you don't take that personal. And it's so hard not to just spiral. And even that moment of this has given me an opportunity to go run and do something I love when I don't get to and to spend time with a person that I love during a time I don't normally have to and to take something that's happening to you mm-hmm. and take it back and say, no, no, you're going to deliver my paperwork on my time. I'm going to read that when I'm ready because you no longer have control over me. Those are powerful things. Did your ability to do that, is this just innately who you are and how you think? Or do you really think that you forced your thinking on this by deciding I am going to take on this, for lack of a better word, methodology? Like I'm taking it on and you forced it until it became natural. Um, yeah, I was not born this way. <laughs> not Lady Gaga. You were not born this way. <laughs> it's not. I was not a Pollyanna. I was definitely like skeptic cynic in a lot of situations. Yeah. I was like a high strung type A hyper achiever for the majority of my life. And it was, oh, you have to figure out, especially if you're in a sales role, right? It's like somebody gives you a quota. Your worth and job security is now tied to hitting this arbitrary number that somebody else set but all of it's on you. And it's this place where you just feel like there's so many external factors. And I certainly felt like this, whether it's university or college, if you're in the U S or a job or health or financial economics. Oh, nine, 2010 meltdown was like, it just, it was so easy to be caught up in all of it. And I definitely did get swept up in all of it. And there was so many times where it was like, this is just what happens. And I guess this is just what I have to deal with now. And it truly never occurred to me. I thought the only people who felt powerful in those scenarios were people who were entitled to feel powerful. (sighs) Ain't that a point. (laughs) And... What I realized was after getting knocked down a few too many times and just being made to feel little and little, I'm like, no, all of us are entitled to feel like we can control what happens to us. And we can't control a tough boss who isn't treating us properly and arguably should not be in leadership at all. But a whole episode on that. (laughs) But we can control that we go looking for a new job. And we can control when we say in a relationship or anything else, enough is enough. Here is my terms. Here's what I want. This is what I'm willing to expect, accept from other people. And really, I think it wasn't like diving into this methodology per se. It was the realization that to feel empowered, we have to have two things. We have to be high in self-confidence and high in self-worth. Those two things often get used interchangeably, but they're different. Am I capable is question one. And question two is, do the things I do add value to insert scenario or role here, right? And if you're capable of great things and you can add value, then in those moments, It's a heck of a lot harder for people to sweep you up because know where you stand and where you should be. And I would say that was more of the turning point for me, starting to focus on, I know what I'm worth and I know what I can do. And if you can't see that, I'm going to find the best opportunity for myself to shine. And like, what a beautifully self-confident and inspiring way to be, because I think especially women Anybody who's underrepresented, we spend the majority of our professional lives having to not only hope that the people around us see our worth and view us as at minimum um, equals, 
But the more that you feel like the world and your external factors get into your head, the harder it is to have that self-confidence, right? And we doubt ourselves really constantly and consistently. And it's, can I actually do that? Am I actually off? Am I worth something? Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of a very good friend of mine recently, and she's fairly young for this, but she was diagnosed with a degenerative sort of progressive disability. And what struck me was at first getting this diagnosis, of course, it hits you and you go, wow, this changes the trajectory of my entire life. And you could do two things when you hear news like that. And one, you can succumb to the fact that, look, what is inevitable is that her body will deteriorate and there's nothing she can do about it. What is inevitable is that the world will see her as being weak because she will look weak. What is inevitable is that her child is going to have to watch her deteriorate and trip and be in pain. And what is inevitable is this disability may be the thing that ends her life and she doesn't know when. And you can go down that path and live there. Mm -hmm. Or you can go down the path that she went down, which is I've just been given the gift of perspective. And I have a certain amount of time where I know that I get to be this version of myself. And so the first thing I'm going to do is fall in love with this version of myself and be unapologetically who I am, because there is a ticking time clock and I don't know how long I have to be this version of myself. And then as my body changes, I can change with it and I can make the choice to make the best out of every single day. I can make the choice to show up and let people know that a diagnosis like this doesn't have to be the end of your life. In fact, it could be the start of something new and beautiful. I can use this to teach my child a new version of what strength looks like and that maybe sometimes people with a cane or in a wheelchair are stronger than anybody else. And I have the opportunity. I've been given the gift to show you that and I know her taking on that second perspective wasn't easy. And I can imagine that she's challenged with it every single day, having to think about how do I show up and embrace the fact that this is temporary. I know for a fact it's temporary. I don't know how long I have. But it's that same thing of recognizing and understanding your self-worth and then bringing that everywhere, bringing it to work, bringing it to your personal life. And maybe just maybe one person will see that like you've just done for everybody listening and say, I see my self-worth. I recognize that. And it gives me the power and the ability to then say that is below my worth and I'm going to make a change. It's a powerful thing to do, but it's a hard thing to do. And the more we hear strong women, strong people talk about that, the more that becomes normal versus hiding. Amen. None of us are perfect that all of us can be perfectly who we are. That's not a cliche. It's recognition of what each of us is innately good at, what we're great at, and the places and people that help us shine. And I feel like we could go on about this and and the application to leadership and how how do you come across authentic. But today, we are getting close to our end of time. I can tell you and I are in our feels. I'm going to go just have a sit down after this. There's a lot <laughs> great. I'm just like, I feel great. I feel exposed. I feel vulnerable. You've, you're a wonderful person. Let's get to our rapid <laughs> reveal section. Pivot. Uh, let's just, we're going to jump out of that. If you are game to take a pivot into having a little bit of fun and talking about some rapid reveal questions. Let's do it. Okay. So rapid reveal. As the listeners know, you have 60 seconds or less to answer each question, but we never follow the rules. I just say them. They're pointless rules. If we want to talk about it more, we're, we are women of the city. We can do whatever we want. So question number one, mm-hmm. softball, what's the first job you ever had? Tell us about it. I would have been working. My dad had some accounting firms and I would have been like 10 years old working in an accounting firm helping to file papers and shred documents and fun stuff come tax season. So real. Uh, I love a good accounting gal. All right. (laughs) (laughs) It's just these things come out of my mouth. Who knows? Number two, what's an irrational fear of yours? Uh, I am so ridiculously scared of heights. It's like the stupidest thing. And I don't even use the word stupid, but hear me out. I can pick up a snake, a spider. None of that is any problem. If I go on a ladder six or seven feet off the ground in my own home over carpet, <laughs> I'm like, ooh, ooh. 
if I fall, I could get a bruise. I'm like, <laughs> heaven forbid. But it's like it's like a physiological reaction. Like my stomach goes, Wrong. but literally my feet are not even above the level that my eyes normally are. So it makes zero sense. Zero. Yeah. But this is why they're, that's why they're irrational fears. And I feel like all irrational fears are rooted in some sense of, like that one, like you could fall off a ladder and uh, die. I'm sure people have, right? So there's something rooted there. I have, the reason I ask this question to everybody on the show is because I have, I think more irrational fears than anybody. Like I'm just, I live my whole life terrified of everything. And one of mine is that I'm going to fall through ice and get trapped like under the, like, and here's the thing. I'm not walking across bodies of water that are frozen <laughs> ever. But the, the thought, I was like, what if? So it, it did the point, I won't even walk over a puddle. I was like, we don't know how deep it is. This could be a cavern, this could be a sinkhole that's covered and I could fall through in the ice and get trapped. So it's irrational, but it's also rooted in like just a little bit of, but maybe I'll die. So the, <laughs> in the, the height, I get it. Like maybe I'll die. I don't know. In number three, and I feel like, this one is so good for you because of what an inspirational person you are. But when was the last time that you failed forward? I don't deliberately fail. I would say I, I stumble pretty regularly. I would say one really significant fail forward that I had is I did a major career shift a couple of years ago. And I did it for a lot of reasons, some right, some wrong, but I did it. And I switched industries and it was a huge change. And on day two, I knew it was wrong. Mm. Oof. And I had left a job where I had security and all the things to take this risk. And I knew it was wrong. And I had one of those moments where I was like, oof, it's day two. So I can resign with no notice. I don't even have to put it on my resume. I can go right back out to market. Nobody's going to know. It's not going to be a blip. I haven't even updated LinkedIn. Like, it's fine. And I talked it out with myself out loud. <laughs> it's fine. Just, hey, girl. <laughs> but I had a full-blown conversation with myself about it, like pros and cons. And I decided to stick it out for seven months. Oof. And the reason why I decided to stick it out for seven months was because I was like, listen, I'm here. I knocked on this door open. I walked in. I'm now here. Is there anything in this room that could benefit me before I leave? And there was a project that was interesting and something I hadn't done before. And I was like, here's a thing in this room that could actually benefit me if I can stick this out. It was a six month project. So this is where the timeline all starts to line up. Delivered the project, got to the end of the project. And was like, I am now done. Coming in here was a failure, if you will. It was a bad judgment call on my part. Doesn't matter. It happened. Made the decision to turn it into something that would benefit me, that I could learn from. And then I made the decision to leave without a backup, without a new role, because it was, again, this place of starting to believe in yourself, what you're meant to do. And the role that I chose after that was definitely with a leader that aligned with me, inspired me. It was a much, much better fit. That was my most significant fail forward in the last couple of years. Something that was equal parts blood, sweat, and tears for that seven months and equal parts of, man, I'm glad I did that. I learned a lot. I think a lot of people have been in that boat and are wondering how to handle it with grace or if they did. And so- for all of the people that now after hearing you talk about something that I think is life-changing, this mindset, how do people find you? How do they connect with you? Where can we track you down? I hide from most socials, everybody, but you will cool. find me on LinkedIn. I'm there daily. So you can find me there. You can find me through Christina. I am also in women in sales and some yes. other groups, but LinkedIn is where I show up almost daily. I love it. It has been an honor to spend time with you and hear you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. That's all folks. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Taking the Lead. If you're looking for more inspiring stories from women leaders in B2B tech, then visit us at motionagency.io slash taking the lead.